All right. Um, it's 1200 CST. So, uh, Sergeant Mason, if you would like to start. Definitely. Um, first, I want to thank Sergeant Garcia for giving us, uh, giving us uh, this opportunity. I think it's a pretty amazing thing uh, to be able to have a platform like this to educate on and, and share things across uh, the Air Force uh, with the medical career field. Um, so I'm Sergeant Mason. Uh, I work at Allison Air Force Base. Um, today we're going to talk about 12 leads and advanced concepts. Um, I wanted to design this class so that we have um, some review on things that we probably most of us already know, um, but also to go over some some extra things that we may not have learned um, in paramedic school or IDMT school or tech school and th things that can really impact uh, the care that we give to our patients and things that uh, can give us some clinical insight on, on how our patients are presenting and uh, how we may have to manage that patient down the road. So we'll jump right in. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about heart anatomy. Uh, we're gonna go over the conduction system and coronary arteries. We're gonna talk about the cardiac cycle. Uh, we're gonna talk about a consistent way to go over rhythms. So five steps to look at your rhythms and go over them. We're gonna talk about heart blocks. We're gonna go over 12 leads and uh, the locations on the various 12 lead uh, consistent with myocardial infarctions. We're gonna talk about things that can imitate heart attacks and myocardial infarctions. And then we're gonna talk about funnel branch blocks, um, different clinical implications that that can give for our patients. We're gonna go over axis deviation and uh, we're gonna go over evidence-based guidelines. Um, so some new things that have come out about 12 leads over, over the years and uh, some of that stuff's pretty awesome. So our cardiac conduction system, we all know we have the SA node. Um, that puts out our normal heart rate. So we have a rate of 60 to 100 beats a minute. And this is our primary pacemaker of the heart. After that, we have our AV node. The AV node, its normal range is 40 to 60 beats a minute. And the whole job of the AV node is to delay conduction. Um, so most of our preload comes from passive filling of that right ventricle. And the AV node slows down conduction to allow that to passively fill. And with this, we have our bundle of hiss. And then it goes into our bundle branches. So we have our right and left bundle branch block. And then um, off the bundle branches, we have our Purkinje fibers, which also have their own conduction system. It's just extremely slow. So we have a rate of 50 to 40 uh, beats per minute if all that's left is our Purkinje fibers. So going into our cardiac cycle, um, this is going to be what uh, consists our primary, our primary rhythm strip, right? So first we have the P wave. And the P wave is the depolarization of the atria. So the SA node fires, the P wave um, shows up on your EKG strip, right? So next we have this P to R interval, which is the space between the P wave and your QRS complex. And this is where that passive filling occurs. So like I said, 80% of our preload happens um, during this time frame. And then next we have our QRS complex. Um, and this is essentially depolarization of the ventricles, the squeeze, right? And then we have our ST segment, which um, is really important for looking for signs of MI. Uh, we look for that ST segment elevation. And then we have our T wave, which is essentially at all resetting. So, you know, the cardiac cycle happens and then the T wave is the reset for the next cycle. Um, so here we're gonna talk about the J point. So the J point's really important to identify where that ST segment starts, right? So that S wave that's coming down ends, and then the J point is essentially where the S wave meets that isometric line where it returns to, you know, somewhat of a normal wave after, after that S deflection. And that's where we use to measure ST elevation on our EKG strips. So when you're going over 12 leads or any rhythm, it's really important to have a consistent approach um, this is pretty much the approach that I use, but the main thing is to find 
a, an approach that works best for you, right? Something that you're going to remember to do consistently every time. If we don't have that, then it's really easy to miss something on, on your 12 leads that could have a big implication for your patient or could cause us to go down a wrong treatment path that could cause us to harm our patient. Um, so the five steps to the rhythm analysis that I use. Um, so first I look at my rate, right? I calculate my rate. If it's fast or slow, I look over my rhythm and this is, uh, you know, is it regular or irregular? I look at my P waves to see if they're there, if they're where they should be. Um, and then that P to R interval. And then I look at my QRS complex. I look and see if it's wide, narrow, um and if there's any anything going on with the qrs complex so starting off with our rate um there's multiple steps that you can get to calculate the rate um so this method here you look at your strip and you try to find a qrs complex that lines up with uh, one of the thick lines one of the big boxes and you look where the next qrs falls on your strip so if it falls on the next uh, next big box, then you have a rate of 300. If it falls on the second big box, you got a rate of 150, third, 100, so on and so forth down the line. The next step to calculating a rate that you can use is the six second method. So most of your strips are six second strips and you essentially just calculate um, and you count how many QRS complexes you have in that six second strip so this strip here, you have seven QRS complexes and you times that by 10 and you would come out with a heart rate of roughly 70. Um, the bad thing about this method and the other method is that you can't get a consistent heart rate with these methods if your rhythms are regular. Um, you may be counting, you know, six seconds of that rhythm where you have, you know, a slower portion of that irregularity and you may get a slower rhythm or a faster rhythm as a result. So next we look at our rhythm in general. So we kind of space out the QRS complexes, measure them, um, and we see are they regular or irregular? And if it's irregular, is it irregular on a consistent basis? Or, you know, some people would call it irregularly irregular. Um, another way that you can do this is you can kind of fold over your, Q, uh, your, your EKG strip and you can fold it in half and shine it up to the light and see if those QRS complexes fall, you know, on the same, same part. And after that, we look for our P wave. So do we have a P wave? And is there one for every QRS complex? Also, we're gonna look and see if the P wave is the direction that it should be. So is the P wave inverted? Is it buried in the QRS complex? Um, or is it after the QRS complex? Because that means uh, that the electrical conduction is coming from a different portion of the heart than the SA node. And after that, we're going to look at our PR interval. So our PR interval should be uh, 0.12 to 0.20 milliseconds, um, or three to five small boxes on our EKG. So each tiny, tiny box on our EKG is 0 0.04, and each big box is 0 0.20. So you're PR interval should never be more than one big box from our QRS complex. Um, if it is, it's considered um, a long PR. So long PR interval, um, there's a few things that can cause that. Um, that's considered a first degree heart block. And that's something that we want to be looking out for. Um, it could clue us into different medications that the patient's taking. Um, it could clue us into past history that the patient might have had. And we're definitely going to question our patient a little bit closer to see what could be causing that heart block. A short PR interval um, can signify a lot of things as well. Um, one big thing with a short PR interval that we always want to be mindful for is if the patient has a possibility of having Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome uh, or WPW. So that's going to change our course uh, with the patient, the different medications that we give, and can clue us in on the course that the patient may take. They may go into an SVT or another excitable arrhythmia that we need to take control of later on down the road. And then a short PR interval can also be caused uh, by a junctional rhythm, uh, which is essentially where the electricity is not firing from the proper place in the SA node and it's coming from somewhere else in the ventricle. So 
here we're going to go over heart blocks. Um, so we have our first degree heart block. And like I said, this is going to be our long PR interval. It's going to be greater than 0 0.20 or greater than five small or five small squares or one big box on your EKG. And some of the causes of this can be AV no disease, increased vagal tone, MI, electrolyte disturbance, and medication. So like I said, some of the medications, you know, you can have beta blockers that can cause this, um, tricyclic, uh, tricyclic medications, antidepressants, or it can be um, due to things like uh, hyperkalemia or other electrolyte disturbances. <clears throat> so next we're gonna have our second degree type one. And this is gonna be where the PR interval gets longer until the QRS gets dropped, right? So you have uh, P wave right here. It's really close to the QRX. The next one's a little further away. The next one's even further. And then you'll have a QRS that's just not there, right? And this is going to look like an irregular rhythm because you're going to have spaces where the QRS isn't there. Um, so the causes of this are typically reversible. Um, and typically it's going to be medications, beta blockers, calcium blockers, um, and medications like the digoxin, right? So I don't know if you guys have ever heard uh, the funny story to kind of explain this, um, but you know, QRS is, is normal and the P wave is the wife, right? And the husband um, is a QRS. And so essentially the wife's waiting home and the husband comes home from work every night, same time and everything's great, right? And then our first degree block would be the wife's waiting at home the husband comes home late every night, but he always comes home at the same time, right? So he's always late, but he always is there. Your second degree type one would be the husband comes later, the husband comes home later and later, and then one night he just doesn't come home at all. The thing about this is that the husband has to come home at least two nights in a row um, or else you're not gonna see the pattern properly. So after second degree type one, we have second degree type two. And um, so this one, the PR interval doesn't get longer. It stays the same. And then the QRS is just dropped. Um, so the causes of this are typically MIs, um, past MIs, things that have caused heart damage. Um, it can be caused from increased vagal tone and different medications. Your beta blockers can cause this as well. So this one, the wife, the P wave is waiting at home. Um, and sometimes the husband, the QRS comes home and sometimes he doesn't. Um, but when he does, it's, it's always at the same time. The next type of block is our third degree AV block. And this is essentially where that, that electrical conduction is completely severed. You have your atrial conduction that is, you know, the P waves generating and transmitting and the, Q, uh, the QRS is transmitting but there's no correlation between the two. Um, so the cause of this, pretty much the same as the rest, it can be caused by progressive heart disease, um, MIs, ischemia, so different things, you know, uh, that cause low oxy oxygenation can cause this. Um, this is gonna be typically a slower rate um, because you have the ventricular conduction coming through, which as we know is a rate of uh, 20 to 40. And so this typically needs a pacemaker. Um, so some of the things that we can do for this patient, we can transcu uh, transcutaneously pace this patient. Um, we can try different medications, but it's probably not gonna work. And um, these patients can be very sick, right? They can have uh, definitely a large increase of low blood pressures or hypoperfusion and uh, present very sick. So next we're gonna start into our 12 leads. Um, so our 12 leads, the most important thing to know is that this computer generated diagnosis is not very accurate, right? Um, we've probably all seen cases where it's, it's called out STEMIs or called out other conditions that just weren't there. But what's important to know as well is that the measurements um, to the left of the diagnosis on most EKG strips are extremely accurate. Um, so most of them show the heart rate, they show the QRS duration, the PR interval, and this all is extremely accurate on our EKGs and is super helpful 
um, when we start talking about the other conditions that we're going to talk about today. Um, so when you're looking at 12 leads, um, and, and specifically, you know, when you're analyzing a 12 lead for an MI, I always try to think of the three eyes, right? So you have ischemia, um, injury, and infarct. So ischemia um, is a lack of oxygen in the heart, right? It could be the onset of a blockage that is going to cause an MI later, um, or it could just be that the patient um, has a uh, pulmonary issue. They're not getting enough oxygen to um, perfuse the heart well. This is going to be uh, shown on your EKG as ST depression or T wave inversion. Um, the next phase of the three eyes is your injury phase, and that's when you have that prolonged ischemia and you're starting to get damage to the heart muscle. Um, and this is going to show up, as we all know, as ST elevation. And then after that, um, you have the infarct phase where where the injuries already occurred, um, the heart muscle's already dead, uh, portions of the heart muscle are already dead, and you're going to see long-lasting EKG changes. Um, but at this, at this stage, it's pretty much irreversible. They're not going to be able to reperfuse this patient um, or give them fibro, uh, fibrinolytics, and um, the damage is already there. So here uh, we can see a graph. We have elevation versus depression, right? So you take that J point, you measure it. Um, if it's greater than one millimeter above the isometric line, um, it's considered ST elevation. If the J point is below the isometric line, then you have ST depression, right? Um, so ST depression is typically ischemia. Um, sometimes it can be reciprocal changes from our, um, from our leads. It's showing opposite changes from the ST elevation. Um, when you're looking at the opposite portion of the heart. And so here uh, we have an EKG. I apologize if it's not very clear, um, but here we can see ischemia, right? So the big thing here is we have ST depression, right? So some of the things that we can see here, we have, um, let me see if I can get this to work. So we have ST depression in the, in the lateral leads there, V4, V5, V6. And another thing to look here is that we have um, what you call hyperacute T waves and V2, V3, um, and you can see them in V4 and V5 as well. And so a lot of people consider S or, uh, T wave elevation or you know elevated T waves to be consistent with hyperkalemia, right? And so I use elevated T waves with caution when I talk about hyperacute T waves, um, but it kind of presents the same. And the thing with these T waves is that you can have T wave elevation with ischemia as well, but the difference is going to be with the hyperacute T waves, they're going to be very symmetrical, right? They're going to be very symmetrical, very, very tall. And this signifies that, uh, you know, the heart muscle has low oxygenation. And this is an EKG that over time, we're going to probably see that ST elevation come up. And this patient's probably going to have a very profound ST elevation in these anterior and lateral leads here. So here, like we talked about earlier, we have the phases of a coronary event or an MI. Um, so you have your normal EKG strip, and then we're going to get those hyperacute T waves. Um, so super wide, super tall, but they're, they're mainly going to be symmetric, right? And then that's going to progress into our ST elevation um, MIs. So once the, the MI is going on, we're going to start seeing that T wave to go down and invert. And then um, these Q waves are going to pop up, right? So a Q wave is going to signify that we have um, some heart muscle damage. And the way that we can kind of see these Q waves is if they have a width of one small box, um, a depth of greater than two millimeters, or if the Q wave is greater than 25% of our QRS height, um, then that signifies that there's been some tissue damage occurred as a result of the MI or, or the other event, right? So here we can see our coronary circulation. Um, this is really important when we're looking at our 12 leads and trying to identify um, where the MI is at. And that's important because um, 
being able to localize the MI is going to lead us down different treatment paths, right? Um, I'm sure we've all heard that, you know, if we give nitro to an inferior MI patient or, or a patient that has a blockage over here in this right coronary artery, um, that it can cause them to tank their blood pressure and different things, um, which is true a lot of the times. And so we want to be able to identify where our MI is so that we can, you know, anticipate the clinical course of the patient and be able to treat them appropriately as they go through the disease process. Um, so on this, you have um, your right coronary artery it comes off the patient's right side of the heart. Um, it'll be on the left side of the screen here. And that goes around and it goes around the right side of the ventricle and along the back of the heart and perfuses that whole right side. Um, then you have your left main and that branches off into several branches. You have your left anterior descending, um, your left, uh, left circumflex that goes around to the posterior portion. Um, and then there's other arteries as well here. And then on this picture, you can see that they have a black dot where you have uh, common coronary artery blockage. Um, let me see if I can get this to work here. It's not gonna work. All right. So next we have our 12 lead here, and this shows um, where we can localize the portions of the heart. So this one's a little bit different than we typically seen in the past. Um, new guidance has come out and a lot of cardiologists are using this nowadays to where V1 and V2 used to be classified as septal leads, right? So we had the Lili saw acronym and you can still use that. But what they found is that by grouping V1 and V2 in the septal category, um, that a lot of MIs were getting misdiagnosed. So to diagnose an MI, um, they say you need ST elevation in two or more contiguous leads of over one millimeter, right? That's typically the criteria almost everywhere you go. And they were finding that with V1 and V2 being grouped and V3 and V4 being grouped into anterior, that a lot of people that might have some elevation in V2 and V3, even though they weren't considered contiguous because V2 is septal and V3 is anterior, that these patients were getting missed a lot and um, not being taken to the appropriate facilities, uh, such as the cath lab or, or facilities um, that have cardiac capabilities. These patients were getting missed, so they've, they've kind of reclassified this into where V1 through V4 is all considered anterior, right? Um, so that way you can kind of group them together and if there's any elevation, it can be considered contiguous leads and that they would meet criteria to go to a cardiac facility. Um, so we see up top left, we have our lateral lead, right? So one is considered lateral. Um, two, three and AVF are always going to be our inferior leads. Um, AVL is another lateral lead. So one and AVL are paired together. That's considered high lateral. Um, and then we have V1 through V4 that's looking at that anterior septal portion of the heart, the front, and then V5 and V6 is looking at that more left lateral portion or the left ventricle. Um, so we're gonna talk about inferior MI. So as we mentioned on that last graph, um, that's gonna be our two, three and AVF. Um, what's important to note is that you're always gonna have reciprocal changes in one and AVL. So, what they've seen is that when these MIs progress, right, from a normal normal physio uh, physiology to ST elevation, the 88% of these MIs lead with ST depression in AVL. And so that's typically not ischemia, that's a reciprocal change that you see before lead three, um, before that ST segment starts to elevate in lead three. So in 90% of the population, um, our SA and AV node supply comes from our right coronary artery. And so what this means for our patient is that, you know, our primary conduction system of the heart is supplied by the, the right coronary artery, which is what this inferior portion of the heart's gonna look at, or uh, inferior portion of the EKG. So this can lead to profound conduction deficits and delays. It can lead to our heart blocks. It can lead to, um, you know, hypo, uh, low blood pressure, hypolemia, um, and it can lead to these Brady dysrhythmias. So this is what the inferior e, uh, wall stem is going to look like on our EKG. So here you can see 
we have our ST elevation in two, three and ABF, um, definitely greater than a millimeter. And we also have our reciprocal changes in AVL. So we have our ST depression on AVL. Um, here you can see some ST depression in V1 and V2 as well, um, which is most likely uh, posterior involvement with the CKG. Um, so like I said, you're always gonna see those reciprocal changes in AVL and lead three. And these leads are twins, right? So if you have reciprocal changes in one or the other, it's almost definitive that there's an event happening to, to that uh, coronary system on that inferior side, right? Um, if you don't have these reciprocal changes, then that can kind of clue you in that the condition may be one of our mimickers. Um, and we'll talk about all these mimickers later on that can, that can simulate this ST elevation and that a lot of people mistake as uh, MIs. But if you don't have those reciprocal changes, then it should, uh, should kind of clue you in that there may be something else going on. Um, so here's a practice strip, right? So we start off, we start off going systematically through our EKG. We start with lead one. Um, we see a little bit of depression there with our ST segment. And then we go to lead two and we definitely see the ST elevation, right? So we go to three, um, have elevation and then elevation and AVF as well. And then we check AVL to make sure that we have those reciprocal changes. And we definitely have those reciprocal changes or mirror image in lead three as well. Um, we go over to V1 and we have this very profound ST depression in V1, V2, and V3. And so that's a sign that um, there's posterior involvement with this inferior MI. Um, so over, the uh, over time, they found that 97% of all um, inferior wall MIs also have uh, posterior involvement um, and vice versa. So only about 3% of posterior MIs don't, do not have inferior involvement. And those are um, very critical and they have a very high mortality rate. And the reason that they have such a high mortality rate is that they're very difficult to see on these EKGs. And most of the time, this ST depression in V1 and V2 isn't as profound um, if there's not inferior involvement. And so they're very easily missed. And these patients are taken to the ER and then the ER will miss the, the presentation. And these patients don't get the reperfusion therapy that they need. So with these inferior MIs, it's very important um, to consider doing a right-sided EKG, um, but more importantly, to do the, at least the V4R. So um, I know in my clinical practice or on the ambulance, um, I've never done a right-sided EKG. Um, but what I will do is I'll, I'll basically place a lead um, on the patient's right side in the same position as V4, um, so that fifth intercostal space, but on the opposite side, and this, um, they found that is 98% accurate um, to diagnosing a right ventricular infarction. And with this, it's so specific that only 0.5 millimeters or half a small box of elevations needed um, to confirm a right ventricular infarction. And the reason this is important is because with an inferior MI, it may not include the right ventricle, right? And as we talked about before, we've all, you know, heard the story that, you know, you absolutely cannot give nitro to a patient that has an inferior infarct. Um, it'll bottom out the patient's blood pressure and it's very, very hard to get that patient back. Um, which is true, true, but mostly in the case with these patients that have a right ventricular infarction. Um, so if you have a right ventricular infarction, those are the patients that are, you, you definitely want to be cautious giving nitro to. Um, you're definitely looking at severe preload issues and things like that down the road. So you'll want to fill the tank, um, give them a fluid bolus before you think about giving any nitro, get that systolic blood pressure up. And, um, and then you're also going to be very, very, um, you know, cognizant of hypovolemia in these patients. Um, so like I said, about half of all inferior MIs have associated right ventricular infarction, which is, which is why it's so important to kind of clue into that 2, 3, and AVF. Um, be cautious when we're giving nitro to these patients, but you definitely don't want to withhold it. And you can pop that V4R over 
and see if they're having um, ventricular involvement and then we can kind of decide our clinical course from there. Um, if they're not having a ventricular um, infarction, then we can get some fluid on board. We can start with a 250 uh, or 500 cc bolus, and then we consider it can consider giving that nitro. You know, once we fill the tank. Um, another important thing is is don't be afraid of pain management in these MI patients. You know, our narcotics, our fentanyl, our morphine, um, they can definitely you know reduce the blood pressure, um, especially with uh, right ventricular infarction or an inferior STEMI, but Pain management a lot of the times is gonna relax the patient enough that they're gonna reduce their cardiac load and the, the amount of oxygenation that their heart requires. And it's actually gonna give them um, improvement over the, over the duration of, of that disease process. So next we're gonna start looking at uh, the septal and anterior portion. So like I said, they've kind of moved away from calling V1 and V2 septal. Um, you definitely should still go off your protocols though if your agency still requires, you know, um, identification of the contiguous leads and septal and anterior portion, um, you know, definitely be cognizant of that. So I have a question here. Uh, so it says to clarify about that right-sided four lead, is that just moving the four lead or replacing another lead to, uh, to the right side, fifth intercostal? Um, so that's a great question. So we'll go back to that slide. Um, so the way I do this, is um, I just move V4 over, right? Um, because you definitely don't have that, uh, you know, an extra lead to place over there. So almost on all my patients, I will place, uh, you know, your normal leads, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. And I will place another lead um, that I leave alone in that V4R location. So that's gonna be the right side, fifth intercostal space. And I will do my normal 12 lead, my normal left side 12 lead. And if I identify an inferior STEMI in that 12 lead, um, then I'm ready to go to do a, a right-sided or V4R EKG. And I just pop that lead over um, and I print a second 12 lead. Um, and then I always, um, you know, you always got to be sure to identify that that's V4R because on the 12 lead, it'll still just reflect as V4. Um, so you want to be sure and clearly identify that as V4R so that when you're delivering that patient to the emergency room or the cath lab, that they know that that's a uh, right-sided uh, lead. Um, but that's how I take care of that. And yep, you just move it right over to the left side there or the right side from the left to the right. Um, so our septal and anterior MIs, um, these patients, they can have um, some pretty profound, uh, profound conduction issues as well. Um, a, lot, a thing that you'll see in a lot of these patients um, will be the third degree heart blocks and um, junctional rhythms, things like that. Um, so here we see uh, lead one, we have about one millimeter of elevation in lead one. So we know that's high lateral. Um, we look at two, three, and AV, uh, uh, AVF, and we don't see really anything there. We might see a little bit of depression in lead three here. Um, we have a little bit of elevation in AVL, which is also a high lateral lead. Um, but then we start looking at V1, V2, um, we definitely start seeing this very profound elevation. And this is probably going to be one of those EKGs that you print it out and you look at it and you go, oh crap, you know. Um, very obvious um, that we have this very large ST elevation here. Um, when we start talking about the mimickers, this is going to be an EKG that you kind of want to go over and see if, if there's any mimickers um, that are present that could be causing this ST elevation um, to rule out an MI. But we're still going to treat the patient the same. We're still going to do um, our MONA algorithm. So, you know, we're going to do our oxygen, our morphine, our aspirin, um, you know, start an IV and transport them to a cardiac facility, but it may clue us in, right? So here's another practice case. Um, so we go through the motions, we go look at lead one, um, definitely some elevation. Lead two, we have some depression, I have some uh, increased depression in lead three and AV, uh, AVF, and then elevation in AVL, uh, V1, V2, V3, V4, pretty much across the board, right? We have elevation. 
Um, so this is a lateral wall MI, um, but it's definitely the whole, the whole thing, right? So we have high lateral, low lateral involvement. And if we go back to our coronary artery diagram, you, you would basically um, be able to identify that this blockage is really high in that right main coronary or left main coronary artery. Um, and it's basically causing um, damage all throughout that left side of the heart muscle. Um, here's another practice EKG. So lead one, we have elevation. Um, lead three, uh, two, three, and ABF, we have some depression, AVL, elevation. Um, on this one, we don't have near as much elevation in V1, V2. We, we don't have any, um, but we start seeing the elevation in V5 and V6. So this would be our low lateral um, MI. And so this would be, you know, things that, cause a third degree heart block, um, cause a lot of afterload issues, but we're not gonna see the preload issues that we would with the inferior EKG. Um, so like I mentioned before, our treatment of STEMIs are all gonna be the same no matter the location. You're just gonna be a little bit more cognizant on you know, the path that you take and managing that patient. But we're gonna monitor ABCs. Um, we're gonna start IV access, anticipate deterioration of the patient. Um, we're gonna administer aspirin and O2 if indicated. So I put this on the slide um, because we definitely don't wanna give oxygen when it's not needed. So oxygen is a medication, just like any other medication that we give to our patients. And oxygen is one of the most pay, uh, potent vasoconstrictors um, that we have in our body. And if we have a patient that is oxygenating well, they have a 98% O2 set, 99% O2 set, then we do not need to give that patient oxygen. Um, if we put that patient on high flow, 15 liters a minute of oxygen, what that's gonna lead to is vasoconstriction of those coronary arteries um, around whatever existing blockage is there. And it's um, gonna reduce blood flow to the tissue even more and it can cause these patients to get worse. So don't withhold O2 if your patient needs it. If your patient's setting you know, 94 or lower, definitely um, give that patient some oxygen. Um, but think about those different processes um, when you're giving treatments to your patient and what kind of results that you're gonna get from that treatment, both good and bad. Um, for all STEMIs, we're gonna consider our nitro, our fentanyl, um, less likely nowadays is our morphine, but it, it still definitely exists. And then um, we're gonna give that patient fluids to maintain the pressures. Um, the right sides, our patients are very fluid dependent. Um, if we have a left-sided STEMI or a, you know, a lateral or anterior, um, you know, that can cause um, some heart failure and we wanna be careful with our fluids and check lung sounds and things to make sure that our patients aren't developing uh, pulmonary edema and getting fluid in their lungs um, from that left-sided heart failure. And then perform serial 12 leads. So this is so important. Um, I used to work for a really rural agency and we would have two hour long transports and a lot of our providers would get one EKG um, right, you know, when they got to the house and then they wouldn't get another 12 lead um, the whole time. And 12 leads can change by the minute. Um, I've seen normal 12 leads go to, you know, just massive tombstone elevation um, within the course of five to 10 minutes. So definitely don't rule an MI out just because you have a negative 12 lead. And, and get those serial 12 leads so that we can see how our patient's progressing. Um, so with these patients and all of our patients, we're gonna, we're gonna get our history, we're gonna get our sample and our OPQRST. Um, we know that heart attacks are the most common cause of congestive heart failure. Um, and if these patients are having pulmonary edema, definitely you know, treat them with CPAP if, they're, if their blood pressure and mental status um, can tolerate it. Um, we're going to notify the hospital with the STEMI activation, and um, we're definitely going to give them an ETA. Um, if you have the capability to transmit, definitely transmit that EKG. Um, a lot of times that just speeds up the process for the patient, and uh, some systems you can transport that patient directly to the cath lab and lay them on the cath lab table, and you greatly, greatly speed up that reperfusion therapy for that patient and definitely um, you know, increase their, their survival outcomes. 
And just remember that you don't have to have reciprocal changes to diagnose the STEMI and call in the STEMI alert. Um, so some places it's taught that, you know, you have to have uh, ST segment elevation and two or more contiguous leads with reciprocal changes. And that's, um, you know, evidence has shown that the reciprocal changes aren't near as important as they used to think they were. And um, a lot of times you won't see those reciprocal changes. So you do not have to have those as criteria um, to call in a STEMI alert to whatever facility you're transporting to. Um, so now we're gonna talk about multiple conditions that can kind of imitate heart attacks, right? Imitate our myocardial infarctions. Um, and these are important because we definitely don't want to um, cause a false alert for some of these common occurrences that most of the time are actually normal presentation for our patients, right? So some of, uh, some of the imitators for MIs or infarcts are um, left ventricular hypertrophy, so that enlarged left ventricle. Um, pericarditis, so you have your pericardial sac on the outside of your heart muscle. And um, so that's fluid inflammation in between the, the pericardium and the, and the myocardium, and it can cause pressure and cause ST elevation changes. Um, pacemakers are probably uh, the number one imitator that gets uh, misdiagnosed for MIs. Um, we have early repolarization and bundle branch blocks. Uh, so bundle branch blocks are another big one that um, definitely can mimic an MI. Um, some of these can be an acute presentation. Uh, you know, the pericarditis is likely going to be acute. Um, but a lot of these are chronic. The patients live with them. It's an everyday occurrence for them. Um, some of them are going to know about it. Um, so you can get that through your history. Um, but it's important to be able to kind of pick these out to know what's normal for the patient. And uh, so we're not causing these false alerts. So left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, so this is shown on our EKG by what they call excessive discordance, right? So you have just these massive, massive QRX complexes. And the way we figure this out is you take um, the S wave depth, so the, the negative deflection in V1, and you add that to your tallest R wave um, in V5 or V6, whichever one's taller that you can pick out. And if it's greater than 35 millimeters, um, that would be indicative of left ventricular hypertrophy, right? So there's some other criteria. Um, if you have an L wave or an AVL R wave greater than 11 millimeters, um, or an ABF R wave greater than 20 millimeters, and that also signifies um, left ventricular hypertrophy. So here's our EKG, and in this we can see here, so we take our S wave, our negative deflection on V1, um, and we look at how many millimeters that is, and so this one is about one, two, three, so about four um, large boxes, um, or 20, about 20 millimeters high, right? And then we try to signify our tallest R wave in V5 or V6. Um, so V5 here, the QRS is so tall that it's buried up into V4 here. Um, but we can see V6, so we'll count that. And it's about one, two, three, four, about five, um, five large boxes. Each box is five millimeters. So you got five, 10, 15, 20, about 25 millimeters um, measurement of your QRS in V6. And so we had 20 to 25, that's about 45 millimeters. And that's greater than our, our 35 millimeter um, criteria to diagnose LVH. Um, this is the mimicker because of the discordance, right? So discordance is when the QRS and the ST segment go different directions. So the QRS is so powerful that it kind of generates um, an ST segment elevation appearance in our leads here. So this is definitely one that a lot of providers would look at and go, holy crap, this patient is having an MI. We're going to call on the cath lab. We're going to, you know, go through this progressive treatment. And we're still going to treat this patient the same, especially if they're having chest pain. We're still going to do our aspirin. We're still going to do our nitro um, and, you know, treat this patient accordingly. Um, but in the back of our mind, we can kind of pick this LVH out and know that, um, you know, this patient might have something else going on. 
Um, so our next imitator is pericarditis. So pericarditis can be caused uh, from a bacterial or viral illness. Um, most of these patients are going to have a history, a recent history of being sick or having a surgery or dental issues, um, something of that nature, right? In their clinical presentation, they're going to have um, super sharp chest pain. It's going to be pretty pinpoint. Um, and most of the time, it's going to radiate to the base of their neck. Um, one thing that can kind of clue you into these patients is that these patients are going to have um, positional dyspnea, right? So they're going to they're not, not going to be able to lay on their back. They're going to have shortness of breath if they lay down. They're going to want to sit up all the time. And, and um, so that can kind of clue you in that there's some uh, possibly a pericarditis issue going on. Um, this is often misdiagnosed in STEMI. Um, you're going to have ST elevation all over the place. Um, and this is going to be typically seen in your younger patients. So here's a pericarditis EKG, and you know, right off the bat, it's obvious that there's ST elevation all over the place. Um, you have elevation in one, two, three, AVF, um, pretty much all your precordial leads, a uh, little bit in V2, and then you know you have all this elevation from V3 uh, through V6, right? The one thing that I want to kind of point out here is remember that we talked about how lead three and AVL are twins. Um, what you see in one, it should be a direct mirror image of the other. And in this one, in lead three, we have really profound ST elevation. But we look at AVL and there is some ST depression, but it's just barely any. Um, and it's super far from being a mirror image to this lead three. So that's one thing that can kind of clue you in that this is most likely not an MI and that there could be some other things going on. So our next, uh, next thing we're gonna talk about is our pace rhythms, right? So our pace rhythms are another thing that's just typically commonly misdiagnosed as an MI. You can see um, it can typically cause some pretty profound ST elevation. And it's probably the number one for false STEMI activations um, pretty much everywhere I've worked. So one thing about this EKG is everything looks super similar. All the waves, all the QRS complexes going across the board um, are super similar. similar. Um, on these EKGs, you're, you're definitely going to be wanting to look for the pacer spikes, um, especially if you have these really wide complexes, really wide and you know, kind of diffuse ST elevation. Um, but you're not always going to see pacer spikes, especially, you know, the new, um, the new pacers are coming out and these pacer spikes are really tiny a lot of times. And another thing is, um, you know, used to, we could kind of, you know, get the patient undressed, take their shirt off while, as we're doing the EKG and you would see the obvious pacer in the upper left chest. Um, their skin would be protruding, but nowadays um, they're putting these pacers so many different places. They may put them in the axilla, they may put them in the abdomen, and some of them are, um, are even uh, intraventricular. So you're not always going to see these pacers on the outside of the body, and you may not always see the pacer spikes. Um, another thing to note is you look at AVR, and AVR should always have a negative deflection, right? So we look at AVR to make sure that our limb leads are placed correctly. And if our limb leads are on right, you'll have a negative deflection. Um, but another thing is if you have these ventricular rhythms, AVR will be actually upright or have a positive deflection. Um, you'll also have poor R wave progression. So if you see um, V1 through V6, you look at V1 and it should be primarily negative. But over time, over the course of you going through the EKG, by the time you wind up with V6, you should have a primary um, QRS or upward deflection, right? And so if you have this poor R wave progression, that's an another um, kind of thing that can kind of clue you in that this patient uh, may be paced or have a ventricular rhythm. Um, the important thing is don't read the diagnosis from the EKG box, right? Um, I would say most EKG machines um, nine times out of 10, it's, it definitely could indicate that this patient's having a STEMI. Um, just go through, analyze your EKG carefully, and um, definitely try to 
try to pick out those signs such as the sp pacer spikes. Another thing about these patients is that they're gonna have um, a very regular heart rate. Uh, most of our patients, we're gonna see their heart, weight, uh, their heart rate go back and forth um, you know, by 10 or so points. Um, but these patients are gonna be locked in typically to a specific number. Um, so one of our last imitators we're gonna go over is uh, benign early repull. Um, our patient population that we have, you know, they're typically young, healthy, um, fit and active individuals. And this, those are gonna be the patients that you typically see BER in. Um, so I've seen this a lot on the ambulance um, here at ILSN, especially, you know, after PT tests, things like that, you know, patient falls out, they have chest pain. We do a 12 lead and, you know, inevitably uh, they'll have BER on their 12 lead. So this is the normal physiology for most people. So this is something that they live with every day. Uh, most people don't know that they have it because it's really not that significant. Um, but it, it definitely produces ST elevation. Another thing that you're going to see on these 12 leads uh, um, with BER is pretty tall T waves. Um, so these are going to be different than the hyperacute, but essentially that's just kind of um, an over-exaggerated wave that's printed on the EKG because um, the ventricles start repolarizing um, before that heartbeats completely finish transmitting on that EKG. Um, so like I said, it's typically gonna be your male patients, um, younger, 20 to 40 years old, and this is very prevalent in African-American um, ethnicity. The thing about that you can kind of pick out that it's BER is these, the, the fish hook appearance that the ST segment has. Um, so on this one, if you kind of block out the QRS here, um, you look at the T wave into the, into the ST segment and it's got that little notch and it just looks like a fish hook. Um, so here's another uh, benign early repull EKG and notice that this patient, if you were to go uh, off the dock in the box in the upper right hand corner, um, meets ST elevation MI criteria, um, consider acute infarct. And that is definitely not the case for this patient. Um, we go through our EKG and lead one looks good, lead two, um, we notice a little bit of elevation, about one eh, half a millimeter or so. Uh, we look at lead three and it's kind of progressive and then we have um, some elevation in V5, V6. But if you look closely on this EKG and this is kind of a, you know, it's got a lot of artifact in it, um, but you can pick out the fish hooks, especially um, over here in lead two, three and AVF, um, you got the fish hook appearance and then you have the fish hook appearance as well. Um, I would say in V4. Other than that, it's kind of hard to see it on this one, um, but it's definitely going to look, um, most of the time, you, you can pick it out pretty clearly. Um, so now we're going to go into bundle branch blocks. So bundle branch blocks can definitely imitate an MI, um, but bundle branch blocks can also be caused by an MI. So it's it's an imitator. Some patients live with this. It's, it's their normal physiology. They've had cardiac uh, problems in the past or elderly, and this is just their normal physiology. Um, but some of these patients um, will have a new bundle branch block. They've never had it before. And these patients, you definitely want to kind of think a little bit more carefully about and analyze the EKG to see if this patient's having an MI. Um, so the way we diagnose a left bundle branch block is we look at V1 and if the QRS duration is greater than 0.12 um, or 120 milliseconds, then that is uh, an indication that you have a bundle branch block. Um, so our left bundle branch in particular, um, it has two kind of ancillary branches that come off of it. Um, you have the posterior fascicle, it kind of goes around the back of the left side, and you have your anterior fascicle, which is on the front. Um, and these are two separate conduction pathways. Um, the front is only supplied by one coronary artery, and the back is supplied by two. So you have, uh, it's supplied by the posterior and the circumflex arteries. 
Um, and this will be a little bit more important when we talk about um, axis deviation and things. Um, but this um, is definitely something that you want to analyze because it can cause some pretty serious implications for your patient. So we start off with our EKG and um, my picture is not showing up on here for some reason. Um, but picture a steering wheel and you're driving down the road and you stop at a stop sign, right? Um, to turn left, you'll put your blinker down and to turn right, you'll turn your blinker up. Um, so we look at our QRS in V1 and it's definitely um, greater than 0.12. And another thing is we go up here and we look um, at our measurement section and you have 0.1, uh, 0.17. So we know we have a bundle branch block. Um, so picture a car and it's driving from the right side of this strip to the left side and it gets to this uh, V1 segment and it stops at a stop sign and that QRS is telling you which direction to turn. Um, so this would be telling you to turn left. Um, so we would have a left bundle branch block. Um, and I just kind of think if it's negative, it's left. If it's positive, it's right. Um, and that typically seems to be a lot less confusing for most people. So we have a QRS greater than 0.12, a negative deflection in V1. Um, so we definitely have a left bundle branch block in this EKG. There's my picture. So there's your steering wheel, um, down is left, up is right. Um, so here we see our right bundle branch block. So we go through the same methods. So we look at our QRS segment in V1. Um, we measure the duration. Um, this one looks like it's probably two to three small boxes. Um, so definitely greater than 0.12. Um, we do our car method, you're driving along, it's uh, telling you to turn right, so we would have a right bundle branch block. So the thing about these left bundle branch blocks, right bundle branch blocks, typically it's gonna be the left. You cannot diagnose a STEMI in a bundle branch block without Scarbosa criteria. Um, used to, if they had a left bundle branch block, um, we weren't even allowed to call on a STEMI. Um, we weren't allowed to transport these patients to the cath lab and we would take them to the ER and they would have to run labs in troponin um, to get enough reason to take these patients into the cath lab. So Dr. Scarbosa um, came up with this criteria a um, lot of research went into this and they found that through this criteria, it's, um, you, you can accurately diagnose an MI um, pretty easily. Um, the clinical implications to this is if you find a left bundle branch block or an MI um, discovered with a left bundle branch block, you have up to a 60% mortality rate for that patient. Um, and typically they say 40 to 60% rate of, of left-sided heart failure or left pump failure. Um, with these patients. So the way we pick out an MI in these bundle branch blocks is we, we use a Scarbosa criteria and this essentially um, concordant ST elevation greater than one millimeter, um, ST depression greater than or greater than or equal to one millimeter in V1 through V3 or discordant ST elevation greater than five millimeters. So we talked about discordance uh, with left ventricular hypertrophy. It's, it's essentially where the QRS is going one way, the T wave is going the other, and there's this just huge gap, right? Um, that's typically what we're gonna see with bundle branch blocks, and that's what causes ST elevation. Um, so they definitely give less points to that criteria. Um, so it is a point system, and you need three out of 10 points to diagnose an uh, MI in these bundle branch blocks. So this first wave here, that's concordant ST elevation. So the QRS and the T wave are going the same direction. Hello? 
Um, is it just me or did he disappear? Hey, I, I think his internet might have went out or something. Just stand by. Yeah, I lost him as well. All right. We're still here. Yeah, my apologies. Uh, I guess one of the advantages of being at a remote location, right? Alaska and the internet, it sucks. That's All right, we'll get oh, started again. Board, sir? Almost 200 a month. All right, so we were talking about Scarbosa criteria. Um, so you have the concordant ST elevation, ST depression, and the discordant or the very, very widening of the QRS and the ST segment. Um, and you add those up. And if you have three or more points, um, then that gives you the criteria to diagnose a STEMI in the presence of a bundle branch block. Um, like I mentioned before, these cases have a very high mortality rate. Um, you're looking at left-sided heart failure, um, probably uh, most likely pulmonary edema, and these patients um, are most likely going to be very, very sick, right? So here's an EKG that we can see this Scarbosa criteria in. Um, we want to analyze um, and look, do we have the concordant changes of at least one millimeter? So where the QRS and the ST segment are going the same way. Um, so we do have that in this EKG. Um, so if you look here at V5, then um, you can see we have the QRS going up. We have the ST segment going up. It's elevated about two millimeters or two small boxes. Um, so that would autom uh, automatically be the five points. Um, and, and that would be enough to get us to diagnosis of a STEMI. Um, so then we look and do we have depression of at least one millimeter in V1, V2, or V3. Um, so we look at V1, I don't see any ST depression. Uh, we look at V2, um, there's no ST depression. And V3, um, definitely no ST depression. But we do have that excessive discordance. So the QRS is going one direction, the ST segment's going the other um, in V3. And that gives us two more points. So we have a total of five points um, in, this, in this example here. And the reason you can see why bundle branches are, are very commonly misdiagnosed as a STEMI, you have that massive ST elevation um, in V2, V3, and V4 here. Um, and, and just because you have that elevation doesn't mean that you always have a STEMI. So next we're gonna talk about a, a little bit about axis deviation. And this is a topic that confuses so many people when it comes to analyzing 12 leads. Um, a lot of people that I've done different classes with from P school to IDMT school, different things, um, they learn about it and then they forget it because they think that it doesn't really have any implication in their clinical practice. Um, but really this does. And so, when we talk about axis deviation, we're talking about the normal flow of electricity through the heart. Um, so we know that our electricity is supposed to flow from our SA node down to the AV node through our bundle branches. And um, through this example here, you kind of see which direction the electricity flows. Um, so your normal axis deviation is zero. Um, to the positive 90. So anywhere in this, in this plane, you have normal axis deviation. Um, if you go from zero to negative 30, that's, that's left axis deviation, but that's what we call physiologic. That's um, normal for a lot of people, right? So negative 30 to negative 90 is what we would call pathologic axis deviation or um, axis deviation that indicates that most likely something's going on. Um, and then we kind of look at positive 90 to negative 180 um, would be considered right axis deviation. Uh, that's never normal in adult. The only case that this would be normal is um, for a newborn who is um, right side of high, uh, right side of high pressure when they're born. Um, and then that uh, foramen ovale closes and then they transition to a left side of high pressure. Um, but an infant will have uh, right axis deviation. Um, an infant should never ever have left axis deviation. <clears throat> and then in extreme circumstances, you'll have extreme right axis, which is the negative 180 to negative 90 here. Um, that's really not seen a whole lot and we're not really gonna talk about that today. We're just mainly gonna talk about just plain right and left axis deviation. 
So when we look at axis deviation, um, I just want you to think that it left points away and right points together. So we will look at lead one and lead three. Some, some uh, text teaches uh, ABF, and, um, but I just think it's easier to kind of stay on that one side. So we look at lead one and lead three, and if they're all pointing upright, then it's normal. Um, but if they're pointing away, then it's left axis deviation. And if they're pointing together, then you have right axis deviation. Um, so left axis deviation, um, as far as the pathological, so we're talking the negative 30 to negative 90, um, that can be caused by LVH that we talked about earlier, um, the left an anterior fascicular block. So remember we talked about you have the anterior and the posterior fascicles, um, left bundle branch blocks, inferior wall MIs, um, or pace rhythms. Um, so here's an example. So we look at lead, uh, lead one and lead three, and we see that they are pointing away. So that would indicate you have left axis deviation. Um, but we want to rule out um, some of the mimickers, right? So we look and we see if we have LVH. So we take our QRS wave or our QS wave, um, and add it to the tallest wave in V5 or V6 um, and see if it's greater than 35 millimeters, which it's not. Um, so we do not have LVH. Um, so next we wanna look for left bundle branch blocks. So we would look at V1, see if it's greater than 0.12 milliseconds. And then um, it, it is not in this example, so we can rule out a bundle branch block. Um, we wanna rule out inferior wall MIs. So we look at 2.3 and ABF. Um, to see for ST elevation, there is none. Um, and then we wanna look for a pace rhythm. So there's no pacer spikes. We have good R wave progression. AVR is negative deflection. Um, so we do not have a pace rhythm. So the only thing that would be left if we look over the causes would be the left anterior fascicular block. Um, so essentially that's a block in the conduction pathway on that, that anterior fascicle. And um, as we mentioned, before the anterior is only supplied with one blood vessel um, so it's a lot more common than the posterior um, and then here we have right axis deviation so right axis deviation is at positive 90 to negative 180 um, it can be caused by numerous things um, so right ventricular hypertrophy um, COPD is a big thing it causes um, Stress on that right side of the heart causes the right side of the heart to be bigger. Um, one thing that can cause axis deviation in the patient population that we see is uh, pulmonary embolism, right? So um, we can look for pulmonary embolism by right axis deviation. We have the S wave in um, lead one, a Q wave in lead two, and a T wave in lead three. Uh, we can look at it that way as well. Um, and then patient's history, right? Another thing that can cause right axis deviation, um, you have tricyclic uh, antidepressant overdose, uh, lateral wall MIs, or the posterior fascicular block. Um, so that's the one, it's supplied by two vessels. It's on the posterior portion of the heart, so it's, um, it's a little bit less common. Um, and so you have that left posterior fascicular block. Um, so here is an example. So we look at lead one and lead three, they're pointing together. So that would indicate right axis deviation. Most of the time, the, the EKGs are fairly um, decent at picking this out and giving it to you in your diagnosis, but you still definitely don't wanna trust it. Um, you wanna get your history to rule out um, possible PE um, or COPD. Um, you can look for the S wave, so the deep negative deflection in lead one, the Q wave, so um, the deep negative deflection before the, the QRS segment in lead two, um, so the pathologic Q wave or T3, um, so deep T wave in lead three, so we don't have that, we can rule out that. Um, you want to rule out a lateral MI, tricyclic overdose. Um, and so we look at that, there is really no evidence of that. Um, so the only thing left would be this left posterior fascicular block. So we're gonna use 
these things for a practice case, right? So you have a 68 year old male and he calls 911 for general weakness and syncope. Um, he's positive orthostatic hypotension um, and respirations are 18, pulse is 80, blood pressure is 100 over 60 while sitting. Um, he has a drop when he stands and uh, oxygen is 93%. And this patient has a history of type 1 diabetes, so IDDM, insulin-dependent diabetes. So what would we do for this patient, right? So definitely weakness syncope. We want to we wanna get that 12 lead. And this is what that 12 lead shows. So we go through the steps, right? We have, we look at V1 and QRS is greater than 0.12. Um, we look at the, our measurement and it's actually 0.13. So we have a bundle branch block. Um, so we go, we're going in our car, QRS is telling, uh, telling us to turn right. So we have a right bundle branch block, um, which we know are less common. So we go through our other motions. We do Scarbosa, um, different things. There's no Scarbosa criteria in here, but we look at lead one and we look at lead three and they are pointing away from each other, um, which would indicate a left axis deviation. So we rule out those other things and we see he has left axis deviation, but he has a right bundle branch block. And so this is what they would call a bifascicular block. So we talked about the anterior fascicle and the posterior fascicle, and this patient has both of those blocked. Um, so this is a very, very ominous finding when you find this. And so these patients um, have a high incidence of ETAC um, or other arrhythmias. And if you treat this patient like a typical ACLS patient um, by going down the road, giving them amiodarone, things like that, um, or another sodium channel blocker, you will kill this patient. Um, these patients are, you know, that will block that, that, elect, that electricity conduction and it will knock out all uh, their ventricular impulses and um, you will knock out everything that that heart has. So we don't want to give these patients sodium channel blockers, um, amiodarone, uh, procranium, uh, or lidocaine. Um, so if these patients become unstable or develop a dysrhythmia, this is a patient that you want to go straight to cardioversion on, um, regardless of chaps, um, you know, or, or stable versus unstable. You do not want to give this patient medication, and this is why axis deviation and being able to pick out these things is so important, um, because you know if an IDMT is at a GSU or at a deployed location or something like this, um, and you have a patient that develops a bifascicular block, you may have these patients um, for a significant amount of time. Um, you're not gonna be 10 minutes away from a cath lab or 10 minutes away from a level one trauma center and be able to quickly get this patient there. Um, so being able to identify these subtle changes in these EKGs um, is very important because there are a lot of things that um, can greatly harm these patients if you, if you dive in the weeds. Um, so next, uh, we only have four more or a few more slides to go. Um, we're going to talk about AVR and whether or not, um, you know, what it, what's it about. So I know I was taught in paramedic school, AVR, eh, you don't look at it, right? Um, there's nothing really to it. But evidence-based medicine is finding more and more that AVR is actually highly diagnostic. Um, and so what AVR is looking at, it's kind of looking at that top portion of the heart, right? And so they found that when we see ST elevation in AVR, um, you want to look at AVR and V1, right? And if AVR is more elevated than V1, then it's very indicative of a left main disease process. Um, and if V1 is higher, then it's um, highly, highly diagnostic for a lat obstruction. Um, regardless, if you have the elevation in, in AVR, um, this is kind of what it refers to as triple, uh, triple vessel disease. And these patients um, are going to progressively get very, very sick. But these patients were used to be highly missed um, because no one looked at AVR. Um, but this is very, very, it has a very high specificity for this triple disease process or triple vessel disease. Um, so these patients um, in a lot of systems are now being able to go straight to the cath lab. Um, they're automatically 
um, getting reperfusion therapy just based off of this elevation in AVR. Um, and like I said before, these patients were often missed. They would go to the ER, or the ER doc would analyze them. Um, they really wouldn't see anything on the EKG and they would sit in the ER for five, six, seven hours uh, before they were getting reperfusion therapy. So we look at this one, um, we look at ABR and it's definitely elevated about one millimeter. Um, and we look at V1 and it's hard to tell on this one, they look about the same. Um, and it really doesn't matter you know, where the occlusion is, um, but it's just important to know that this patient, you know, otherwise you look at this EKG and you see some ST depression, um, you know, so you would think ischemia, but you really wouldn't pick out that this patient is having a heart attack and if you're not careful, you may take this patient to a normal ER um, or a place that's not appropriately um, equipped to treat this patient. Um, so we can look at ABR for a few other things. Um, so ABR can help you um, be diagnostic in SVT with a barency. Um, a lot of these rhythms, you know, you really can't decide if it's SVT or VTAC. Um, and so as as I talked about earlier, AVR should always have a negative deflection, right? So if you have a normal conduction, uh, normal um, atrial conduction, it'll be negative. Um, so you can look at AVR in a lot of these, and it's hard to pick out if this is SVT or VTAC, but if you look at AVR, you can tell it's negative. Um, and you can kind of go based off of which ends the pointiest, right? So AVR is negative, so in this case, we can kind of pick out this is most likely SVT with aberrancy versus VTAC, and we can treat this patient with adenosine, um, cardiovert them, and hopefully get them converted into a normal rhythm. Um, so same in VTAC. So if it's positively deflected, then we know that it's a ventricular rhythm. Um, so you look at AVR, we have positive deflection. And this is most likely a ventricular rhythm, and we can treat this patient with uh, sodium channel blockers, uh, amiodarone, lidocaine, and get this patient converted. Um, so one of the last things that we're going to talk about is hyperkalemia. And this is a big thing lately in evidence-based medicine. Um, they're finding out that a lot of these patients are being treated inappropriately. Um, they found new, new science behind it. And um, what we're used to do would, would kill these patients um, pretty often. So hyperkalemia, you often have it in renal impaired patients. Um, your EKG is going to have these tall peak T waves. And so we talked about earlier hyperacute versus peaked T waves. And sometimes it's hard to differentiate. Um, another thing is the ST or the QRS segment will get wider. And the thing that they have found with these rhythms is that the QRS segment gets wider and then it progresses into a dysrhythmia. So here we have a, a, a hyperkalemia EKG. You can see the tall peak T waves and these T waves kind of differ from the hyperacute T waves because they're not near as symmetric. You can kind of see this gradual upsloping um, and, and they're not perfectly just round, right? So here we have another practice case. A 59-year-old male is, has general weakness and he's not feeling right. Um, respiration is 22, pulse of 150, blood pressure 96 over 60, and SpO2 92%. Uh, has a history of type 1 diabetes, hypertension, and alcohol use. So we get an EKG, and this is our EKG. And you look at this EKG and You, you're pretty inclined to say that this is VTAC, right? And so you look, you look at uh, AVR and it uh, looks positively deflective. It's really hard to tell when it gets this wide. But you look and you just have super wide QRS. Um, it's really, really wide in this case. Um, so you have what I would call a wide complex tachycardia. Um, you really can't say that it's VTAC until you prove it's VTAC, right? Um, so the map for this patient, our, our mean arterial pressure is good for this patient based off our blood pressure. So um, not really unstable. He has a re heart rate of about 150, um, which is really slow for VTAC, right? You kind of notice that VTAC is normally over like 200. Um, so 
you look uh, poor R wave progression, AVR is positively deflected. So you say it's ventricular. Um, however, one thing that you can kind of pick out in this, and this is a hyperkalemia EKG, is the slowness. It's, it's only 150 um, and it's very, very wide. So it's greater than 0 0.20. And rhythms greater than 20 milliseconds or 0 0.20 are typically not VTAC. Um, and then another thing is you want to get this history and you want to, you know, see if they have a history of renal failure and things like this. So what do we do for this patient? So, you know, do we treat this like VTAC? Absolutely not. Um, if this patient has a history of renal failure, um, and then we see those signs of it most likely not being VTAC, we do not want to treat, um, with ACLS guidelines with, with antidysrhythmics. Um, so the treatment plan for this patient is going to be um, given amp and calcium gluconate. Um, you can use calcium chloride, um, but most services are kind of going away from calcium chloride. And you can give an amp and sodium bicarb. Um, after this, you'll repeat the 12 lead, um, redo your vitals. And what you'll probably most likely find is that the QRS is going to become narrower, the T waves are going to come down, and this patient's going to convert in a more stable rhythm. Um, so like I said before, if it's greter than 0.20 or 20 uh, 200 milliseconds, it's not going to be VTAC. Um, if it's very, very wide and too slow, um, it's most likely hyperkalemia. Um, and this would be a clean kill for this patient if you gave them antidysrhythmics. Um, so that's about it. The biggest takeaways that I want you to take away from this is um, you know, use a systematic approach when you're going over your 12 leads. If you use the same approach every time, you're a lot less likely to miss something. Um, these tricky things um, when it comes to EKGs, you know, you'll think about them more often and you'll be able to put it into your practice and be able to pick those things out a lot more. Um, but the most important thing is to find an approach that works for you, the way you remember it, um, you know, whether you come up with a mnemonic or, you know, just different text-based things. Um, because then we can identify these things early, right? And the earlier that we identify um, these ST segment myocardial infarctions um, or these other conditions, you know, we're going to increase the, the chances that our patient has a good outcome from, from whatever's going on, right? Um, and then another thing that I want you to take away from this is you know, evidence-based medicine continually changes and, you know, they're coming up with new science, you know, every day and 12 leads are not an exception to that. They find new things that they didn't know about 12 leads every day. And so they're finding out that the things that we used to do for our patients killed our patients. Um, and we are not there to cause harm, right? We're there to, to create good outcomes, make our patients better and, by knowing these little nuances about 12 leads, um, we can change our, our treatment modalities, uh, change the way we approach these patients and, and create better outcomes. Um, so that's pretty much all I had. I appreciate uh, Sergeant Garcia and, and those guys for allowing me to teach this. Sorry about the internet problems, um, but I'm glad we got it fixed and, and we're able to finish this up. Oh, no, th thank you so much, Sergeant Mason. We really appreciate you um, coming, stepping forward and teaching the force this. So does anybody have any questions or like clarifications? We'll stand by for a couple of minutes here. Um, I'll get everybody's input. Um, I also want to say real quick, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out, on, uh, reach out to me. I'm on the global. Um, I'll drop my email in the chat here. Um, for all of this, I have a lot of material. I have a lot of research articles and things like that. Um, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions or want any of these, uh, want any of these sources or anything like that. Perfect. So as promised, um, the, the entire Zoom meeting is recorded. So we'll post this later along with uh, Sergeant Mason's PowerPoint slides, and then um, we'll provide that to the force. So if you guys have anything or if you guys have any feedback, the way we can do this better. Um, again, if somebody wants to teach how to suture, you guys can sign up. You guys just let us know and then we'll make it happen. Oh, well, thank you so much y'all for uh, sharing this up, sharing with 
us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much.